When AMD released its Navi cards, it had a strong proposition in terms of bang for buck when you're looking at raw performance. But as I'm sure many of you know, the reference cooler design was too hot and too loud to be recommended. So in a lot of our graphics card reviews recently, we've been saying to just wait and see what the third party Navi cards bring. And finally, we have our first one, and it is the Sapphire RX 5700 XT Pulse card. We did also receive the 5700 version of this card, but a few testing hiccups have meant that we're saving that review for later and focusing on the XT model today. Now in terms of other partners, the launch strategy seems to be a bit staggered. We're getting different embargo dates from different partners. Sapphire was the first to arrive and has the earliest embargo, so they're the ones we're going with, but you can expect to see more reviews very, very soon. Long story short, the Sapphire card is a little bit faster than reference and it is a lot cooler and a lot quieter, so it's pretty good news. Uh, a lot of it is going to depend on the pricing, however, and that's something that we'll come to at the end of the video. Looking at the specs to see what Sapphire is doing differently, the first change to note is the clock speed. Now, modern graphics cards rely on more of a boost frequency curve rather than exact clock speeds, so the figures that you get are more just sort of average reference figures. But the game clock, which is the important one to look at for AMD cards, has gone up by about 3.5%, so hopefully we're going to see some higher boosting from this card. There's no memory overclock on the card. Personally, I think this is a shame. I do want to see more partners pushing the memory a little bit higher, but the pattern does tend to be to just leave the memory at stock these days. In terms of how the card actually fits in in the wider market, we're still waiting to see clock speeds from other partners, so it's unknown at this stage whether this is the sort of average overclock we'll expect or whether it's high or low. Unlike the reference card, Sapphire includes a dual BIOS switch. Now, if you move it back towards the rear I.O. panel, you're going to get it into a silent BIOS mode, and this does actually bring the clock speeds down to reference and it has an impact on the fan speeds and we'll look at all that in the performance testing later. Sapphire has given this card a 241 watt power rating which is 16 watts higher than reference but the power connectors are the same. We've got an 8 pin and a 6 pin plug and this gives a technical maximum available power of 300 watts. Display outputs are also a match for the reference card. We've got three display ports and one HDMI. Physically, the first thing you'll notice probably about the card is that it's very tall. It comes up to around 135 millimeters, so do watch out for that. The good thing is that the power plugs are indented in line with the PCB, so you shouldn't have to worry about protruding cables adding even more to the height. On the flip side, the length is actually a little bit shorter than reference. We measured it to around 260 millimeters. They are using a custom PCB to help bring the length down, but the other part to note is that it does impede on a third PCIe slot, so just watch out for that in your builds. The overall build quality is pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. You've got a nice strong aluminium backplate all along the back and this is joined by a plastic cooler shroud. Color wise it's mostly a black and silver affair so mostly color neutral but there are some red highlights and the sapphire logo along the top is also red illuminated. It's kind of strange these days of RGB to go with one color but I guess it is keeping with the AMD vibe and as far as we know they're going to have RGB on the higher end nitro cards. Now the extra height does allow Sapphire to install some pretty chunky fans. These are 95mm models and these are going to be expelling most of their air back into the chassis thanks to the open shroud. But the horizontal alignment of the fins will mean that some air is going to come straight out of the rear I.O. So the first thing I want to show you quickly is this little quick disconnect fan feature which is something that I really like. If you just poke a screwdriver between the blades you get access to one screw which you can remove and then the fans sort of just pop out of place uh, like so. And they have this little connector on the bottom, which is pretty handy. So if they ever fail, it's not like you have to do anything particularly difficult to get a replacement. The next step is to take seven screws out of the rear of the PCB, and this will allow you to take the back plate and the cooler shroud off. So one quick thing to note is that the back plate does have a little bit of padding on to cool one of the controllers and some of the VRM circuitry and this is something that the reference card did not have so that's kind of good to see. With the back plate off you can kind of just lift the main card out of the shroud and there's one cable to disconnect over here. Note also that the LED draws power from this connector uh, and it has its own connector inside the shroud so if you want to disable it permanently you can just disconnect it in here. Flip it back over and you can remove the retention bracket and this will take off the main heatsink. Whereas AMD was using a vapor chamber for its card, Sapphire has gone with a more classic heatsink. You've got a large copper contact plate and five U-shaped heat pipes meandering through a aluminium fin stack. 
Note that they're also using thermal paste as opposed to the graphite pad that AMD has on the reference design. Last step is to flip the card back over with four more screws and that will remove this little secondary cooling apparatus. This little cooling plate, it doesn't connect directly to the main heatsink, but it does have some surface area of its own thanks to these little fins. It's used to directly cool the memory modules via some pads, as well as the MOSFETs of all the power phases around the card. So although Sapphire is using a custom PCB, the power phase count is the same. You'll see it referred to as 7 plus 1 plus 2. So the 7 plus 1 part refers to the GPU, and it's these seven main phases here. And there's this little extra one, which is like a secondary phase for the GPU as well. And the two is for the memory, and that's these two phases here. There's also one additional phase right here, which is something to do with the sort of memory communication interface between the GPU and memory. All in all, I think Sapphire's done a pretty decent job with this design. The new PCB is pretty compact, which is always good to see, and most of the main components are directly cooled, as well as there's even a bit of cooling on the backplate, which is always nice to see as well. So we're gonna reassemble this and jump straight into the benchmarks. Boosting always varies from card to card, but larger differences are unlikely to be overcome by sample variation. The AMD reference card tails off fairly quickly here as the cooler's limitations become apparent, but Sapphire's improved cooling and overclock give it higher sustained average clock speeds. AMD's new boosting is more granular than before, hence the jagged lines for all cards, but Sapphire has a more consistent pattern regardless of which bias you use, and it's definitely the better card straight out of the box. 3D Mark's granularity makes it good for showing difference between the biases, the silent setting is very much in line with reference performance, while the default boost bias nudges performance up. Here it's about 2%, but in actual games it's 3.5% on average. That's not a lot, but it's still welcome. AMD hardware does relatively well in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, with performance pretty close to 2070 Super. This is also where we see the biggest advantage over the stock RX 5700 card at 17%, compared to a 14% overall figure. The card's highest frame rate is in Far Cry New Dawn, and here Sapphire is right up there again with 2070 Super with a 102 FPS on average. The toughest benchmark is Metro Exodus, but this is another title where performance is excellent versus Nvidia. A smooth experience here pretty much guarantees solid 1440p gameplay in any title. We see great frame rates again in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Sapphire's card is 13% quicker than RTX 2060 Super here, although the difference overall is 10%. The Division 2 is an example of a game that favours Nvidia hardware, as evidenced by an overclocked RTX 2060 Super being on par with this overclocked 5700 XT. Our final title is Total War 3 Kingdoms, another game that prefers Nvidia hardware. Here, Gigabyte's 2060 Super is the faster card, but Sapphire still beats this model by 5% overall, thanks to the wins that we saw before. System power consumption is 16 watts higher using this card versus reference, which reflects exactly the difference in total board power. Nvidia hardware is more efficient, but it's not as drastic a difference as it once was. Interestingly, the silent BIOS seems more efficient than the reference card, despite performance parity, hinting at a slightly more efficient board design overall from Sapphire. The temperature chart is where Sapphire's cooler really shows its value. A full 10 degrees is knocked off the delta temperature, nearly aligning it with Nvidia's Founders Edition cards. Comparing the hotspot data shows an even bigger advantage for Sapphire, but there's no improvement in reported memory or VRM temperatures. The silent BIOS, for what it's worth, lives up to its name, dropping fan speeds about 300 RPM to account for the lower clock speeds. This does see a small rise in memory and VRM temperatures as they receive less airflow too, but the core doesn't really get any hotter. The regular BIOS is still considerably quieter than the reference card, that said, you can still stick to the regular BIOS that comes out of the box, as this is still considerably quieter than the reference card. But you might consider the silent BIOS if low noise is a really top priority. Overclocking is more involved with AMD than it is with Nvidia. Sometimes you'll have a set overclock that looks good, but performance will stay the same or even go down. With this card, the power limit can be increased by 50%, and following that we managed a 50 MHz overclock in Wattman and got the memory to 15.2 gigabits per second. This saw performance increase by over 5% in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. The problem is that it's a hugely inefficient means of getting an overclock. Power consumption skyrockets, and the temperature went up by 10 degrees even as fan speeds were approaching 3000 RPM, which is way too noisy. We'll need to test more cards, but unless you're water calling, we get the impression that overclocks on the 5700 XT will either be meaningless or too costly in terms of power, thermals, and noise. So, there you have it. 
As I said at the start, it's really going to come down to pricing for this card. After all, Sapphire's managed to deliver better boosting, definitely got lower temperatures and definitely got better noise. But when it comes to pricing, we're in a bit of a different situation depending on the market that you look at. Starting with the good news, we're told to expect a $409 price for this card in the US, which is a mere $10 more than the reference card. It's also $90 less than a 2070 Super, so it's on pretty good ground considering that it can actually match Nvidia's card in quite a few titles. Sadly, when it comes to us here in the UK, Sapphire seems to be looking into some sort of post-Brexit apocalypse future, and a $10 premium in the US has become a £45 premium here in the UK. This card will retail for about £425, putting it substantially higher than the £380 you can get the reference card for. Now there hasn't really been an explanation offered for this difference, and it puts the card about £50 cheaper than RTX 2070 Super, although, in fairness, that price doesn't really tend to be found anymore. The Founders Edition for that price is out of stock, and the partner cards tend to go for like £490, £500. So Sapphire does have a bit more room to play with, it's just not quite as clear cut as it is in the US. In terms of pricing in the UK, you're looking at competition with cards like this Gigabyte RTX 2060 Super that we reviewed before. Now our figures give AMD's card a 5% lead overall, but you do have to remember that Gigabyte's card can be overclocked a lot better, and as an Nvidia card it also has the RT cores, which is a feature you just do not get on the AMD hardware. The main thing though is that Sapphire really has addressed the cooling of the 5700 XT, making it an actually viable choice in the market rather than just a card that helps to bring Nvidia's pricing down. Nevertheless, the custom Navi story has gotten off to a good start. Now the thing to remember is that Sapphire by going first makes itself look good because we only have the poor design of the reference cooler to compare to, but lucky for you we do have other models already in stock and we'll be bringing you those reviews as soon as we can. So be sure to hit subscribe to get those reviews as soon as possible, and in the meantime, drop us a comment below if you have any feedback about what you'd like to see next. Other than that, I'll see you next time.